Hello there, guys. My name Whoa, is Opal Cadman, Jesus and Christ. welcome. Today, That's I have three main tasks. Hell. The first oh. one is to introduce you to Koch Media's brand new premium gaming label. Number two is to take a deep dive into some of the games coming to that label. And finally, number three is to show you what the new label okay. will be getting up to in the streaming world. I want to welcome streamers who are co-streaming this today. Me! Some of you guys are guys who I have looked up to and watched for many years. And speaking of people who I've looked up to for many years, I am so proud to introduce Jeff Keeley, who will be helping me co-host us mm. through this entire list of games. Jeff. How's it going? Thanks, Opal. It is so great to be here with you for the first ever live stream from Prime Matter. I was honored yesterday to reveal the label to the world at the Summer Game Fest uh, kickoff event. And wow, you've got a lot of games there in that sizzle, uh, over a dozen games. So I know today you're going to go a little bit more in depth uh, to talk about all these games, talk to a lot of the developers um, but uh, for those of you that, that might have missed it yesterday or just hey, want to see you. it again, oh. let's kick things off with a look at that announcement sizzle reel for Prime Matter. Hey, let's go. Sometimes I ask myself what, what it all means. Let's begin. There he is, man. There he is. Is that who you are? My purpose makes me who I am. I finally have the feeling we're doing something worthwhile. Being relied on to succeed where others would fail. <laughs> Outward? Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, baby. Yes, this guys, one. you just saw 12 games and counting. And that's just the start for Prime Matter. But before we get into these incredible games, what I like to call the juicy bits, I want to talk to you about what Prime Matter is and who we are. Prime Matter oh. is the new premium gaming label of Koch Media. Koch. It dedicates itself to Did deliver a range of immersive and diverse games from amazing development talent all around the globe. It highlights the varied influences of global studios and their different approaches to game making. The new label will lead through creativity and expression with games that enthrall players with larger than life storytelling, create incredible moments, and above all, their oh. fun. The team behind Prime Matter is a melting pot of incredible talent, led by seasoned industry veterans and complemented by a young, fresh, dynamic team of multicultural gaming experts. The team behind are gamers at heart, working with such a wide range of passionate developers, producing games together by gamers for gamers. And that being said, for all you keen-eyed individuals out there, you would have seen that one game was actually missing in our 12-game lineup for Prime Matter during the video. That is a game that comes from the Embracer family itself. Jeff got to sit down with Todd Hollinshead and talk all about Painkiller. Dude, I played Painkiller. All right, you oh, saw man. the news yesterday. Yes, there is so a new Painkiller coming, and Todd is joining me now to... Maybe give us a few more details. I know uh, this is 
kind of a, a fresh project for the team at Sabre and you guys. Uh, first of all, I love that you and Tim Willits are there um, continuing to, to build out Sabre. Uh, and Painkiller was a franchise. You, you and I are both OG. Uh, we remember, uh, it was, was it probably 15 years ago at this point? Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while, uh, you know, closer to two get decades than one. <laughs> My God. All right. Well, but it's one of those classic games. Uh, let me ask you from a prime matter perspective, you know, you've been in the industry like me all those years and we remember that game. Why was this a franchise that, that you guys wanted to sort of bring back? Well, you know, um, Painkiller, when I played it back in the early 2000s, this was a game that had, you know, it was dark, a little twisted, intense, cool guns. These are the things that, you know, kind of hit the nail on the head of what appeals to me in a, in a video game, both as, you know, as a fan and then also as a publisher at Saber. So, you know, we hope we're hoping to capture those same sort of elements and bring those into the new game. Yeah, uh, you know, you guys are certainly masters of doing uh, shooters from uh, all your time at id and uh, painkiller you know does have a lot of that DNA of you know fast-paced action with a little bit of a, a twist to it uh, and you know the fact you guys are working with prime matter is also exciting uh, you know brand new publisher brand new label um, what do you think of, of the fact that they're doing this label and, and you know it's such a diverse lineup of, of companies and partners around it? Um, you know, I know you guys work with a lot of publishers, but it's pretty exciting to, uh, to see a new label announced that, that doesn't happen every day. Pain no, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, within the embracer group, you know, it's just a, it's just a business that is growing. Uh, we've got great leadership at the top. And so Coke media is, you know, wanting to expand their publishing. And I think that, you know, the name they chose prime matter sort of is, you know, it's sort of like the primordial soup of, of putting together stuff from nothing. So, yeah. you know, it kind of makes me think of this is what we do when we make video games. You know, you start to start with Pixel Zero and then at, at the end of the day you make a game. So I feel like that, you know, that kind of resonates with hopefully the, the experiences that we're going to be providing, you know, not just within Prime Matter and working with them uh, between Sabre and our partnership, but, you know, across the, across the Embracer group as well. Yeah, no, uh, it sounds like they have a lot of games in development, but the fact that you are bringing back Painkiller is really exciting. And I know, you know, fans, of course, want to know a little bit about, you know, what's the game going to look, what's going to, you know, how's it going to play? Um, probably can't share a lot of details about it, but you're you're kind of in the early stages of development now on this? Yeah, super early. And, uh, you know, if I anything that I would share, I'd probably get... Uh assassinated for back home once I got back to the developer because you know all these you know the, the the first stuff that comes out almost always gets sort of iterated on and changed and yeah. so we're trying to keep uh trying to keep the lid on the details yeah. until we uh, we have something that's going to be really awesome to show all right well we'll be waiting for it and we know with with you involved uh it's going to be something very special uh fast-paced action I have no doubt so new painkiller coming soon from the team at uh, Saber published by Prime Matter. Thanks, Painkiller. Painkiller Pain Pain was the first game I played that had a weapon that you could impale really enemies to the wall. I really can't wait to hear more about Painkiller and the fact that Todd and Tim and the team at Sabre are working on it. Uh, I think we're going to get something pretty special when they are ready to share more. Uh, so, you know, exciting stuff in that sizzle reel, Painkiller, Payday, Thank but God, I know yeah. there's a lot more we're here to talk about today as well. Right, Opal? Actually, Prime Matter has 12 games under development right at this minute. We're so excited to Twelve show you guys games. what us and the developers have been up to. However, before you see some of the content that we show you today, I do have to make it clear that some of this is pre-alpha, alpha, high-level concept, and some of it is about to release right around the corner. So please keep that in mind when you're viewing today's show. That being said, how do you guys feel about a psychedelic third-person survival horror game? Wait, what? Set on what it means to go on a journey about self-enlightenment and what happens when it all goes wrong. I got to speak with the developers of the Chant Work in Progress title about their game and who they are. Our All game right. is about uh, a group of people who go to a uh, spiritual retreat to uh, seek enlightenment and uh, they basically get a little more than they bargained for. And um, your character uh, has to deal with um, her own personal issues as well as the uh, 
cosmic terrors that uh, become awakened. Cool. So um, what type of genre is this game? I mean, it's a bit hard to pin down with, the, um, with, uh, with all the different influences and, and styles of gameplay, but I'd say we're, we're probably a survival action horror game. Okay. Cool, cool. Okay. And what was, the, like, what was the thinking behind that genre? Is it something that you guys like or do, is it just it came left field? What, what's your decision behind that? Um, uh, personally, we always uh, wanted to make a horror game. Um, our, our, a big part of our core team have a, have a background in uh, third person uh, sandbox games. And um, we really wanted to combine, you know, action mechanics, uh, deep storytelling, and uh, we felt that, you know, the horror genre was a was a really exciting uh, space to, it is. Uh, we need to more take horror. that uh, that background and play around with. Hmm. So, kind of sticking with the horror genre, why did you decide to go with that theme? It's not really like normally what you would see um this whole spiritual awakening thing so what was the what was the idea behind that uh we thought it was just kind of a an interesting um territory to explore uh, uh there is um you know there's a lot of influence um from that with like folk horror of the 70s and 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 jalo horror and so forth that um really really inspired us uh, more from a film standpoint and um, you know, taking that kind of aesthetic, uh, something that was very sensational, very colorful, and um, mixing it in with um, with uh, you know, kind of uh, more action oriented and exploratory game mechanics, we felt was uh, was 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 a fresh sure take on the uh, horror space. Mm. So, kind of speaking about your inspirations and stuff, what video games, real life media has inspired you to create this title? Uh, well, going going way back uh, when uh, Resident Evil, uh, Resident Evil Two is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, Alone in the Dark, uh, okay. Eternal Darkness. So oh, a lot of uh, a lot of games are very inspirational to us. Our game actually started off as a as a game uh, with fixed camera angles and so forth, and then we um, over the course of over the course yeah over the course of development. Um, just especially really focusing on uh, on on bringing more of an, an action element to it. We um, we've since switched to an over the shoulder camera and haven't looked back. So kind of talking about changes and and what you guys are doing on the development side. How close is the game to like the original concept? I understand you guys are still development uh, developing the game's quite far out, but from your original concept to where the game is now, how much has that differed? <laughs> Uh, the core story and uh, I'd say the aesthetic and the themes, those are all, um, those all remain intact. I'd say our gameplay, um, as our team size grew, uh, we, we, added, um, we added more, uh, we added deeper mechanics, I'd say more action to the game. Our game actually has a fair amount of combat in it, um, especially on the melee side. Um, those were things that weren't too prevalent in our original concept. And um, a, lot of, a lot of those things are just kind of uh, based on, um, you know, we, we're, we're a very small team at first. We're still a relatively small team, but um, every new person that joins, you know, brings, uh, brings something new to the mix. So I'd say on that end, uh, uh, the, game is, the game has evolved in, in you know, scope and uh, depth of gameplay. Awesome. Kind of sticking on that point of, you know, you got a small team, there's a lot of challenges that comes with that. What, what was the <laughs> hardest part of making the game so far? Uh, the hardest part it was probably trying to make a game that, um, you know, has, you know, more realistic production values because that's where our, our, our background comes from um, on, a, on a smaller scale and budget. So um, for us, we had to be very strategic. Um, utilizing Unreal, uh, we wouldn't have been able to build this game without u utilizing an engine like Unreal. Previously, we had worked on more proprietary technology. Um, and that's also great because, you know, new people that join the team can, can get up and running on the engine quite quickly. Uh, in addition to that, we've been using photogrammetry uh, from the start um, uh, for both our environments. All of our characters are also scanned actors, um, and we're using, uh, you know, also tapping into a lot of what's going on in our city. Uh, Vancouver has a pretty big film industry, so really tapping into the film and the effects industry and, and, and uh, tapping into that area of expertise to, um, you I know, be to just kind of try to do things um, as efficiently as possible. So you've mentioned like experience in the past and also kind of how rich Vancouver is. How much does that come in handy when you're working on the game? 
Well, it's been a extremely beneficial. Um, Vancouver, you know, is home to a lot of AAA studios. Um, um, a large portion of us um, work together at uh, Rockstar and United Front Games, and um, we also have people who have um, worked at the Coalition and EA, um, as well as some some uh, smaller independent studios as well. And in addition to that, um, you know, having you having the film industry fiber? here, where we can we we can um, utilize you know local. Talent. Uh, we're working with union actors. We're scanning. Um, we're scanning actors as well. They're using for our characters, and um, we're actually currently auditioning um, uh, a couple uh, remaining characters for the game, and um, as well as uh, doing the finishing touches on our new uh, motion capture studio. So we're going to be um, doing a full um, uh, cinematics push over the coming months. That's uh, that's a really exciting. Uh, <laughs> place to be right now. Awesome. Sounds great. In terms of exciting things, when it comes to this game, what are you most proud of at the minute where you are? I think the the thing I'm the most proud of is is just what a what a small focused team can do when they're all, you know, sharing the the same goal and vision. You know, <laughs> we, like, as I said earlier, we you know we come from um, different backgrounds, but everyone's managed to come together and 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 really um, deliver uh, an amazing amount of work for um, for the team size we have and um, yeah it's just it's it's really exciting to be working on a, on a smaller team again and um, you know just having that kind of energy where uh, you know you're working with everyone on the team day to day yeah I imagine that is a lot different to probably what some of you are used to coming from those massive uh, studios so finally what are the benefits of signing up with a global publisher like Koch and also, you know, being featured Koch. on their brand new label? Uh, it's it's truly an exciting uh, place to be. We've been kind of pushing our game as, as far as we could. And um, this partnership is really helping to uh, provide more reach um, and um, more resources. Oh. But... I think most importantly, also just having a partnership on getting feedback and helping to really uh, expand and push the push the vision of the game. Uh, we've already received a lot of feedback on the title, and being a small team, we're we're often in our own little echo chamber. And um, you know, even in a short period of time, we've been able to act on a lot of the feedback, and um, the game has improved considerably uh, since then. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome to talk to you and find out a Just little bit more about right. what you guys are going to be right, offering dude. Let's the go. new label. And I can't wait to let gamers finally get their hands on the content. So thank you for your time. From psychedelic horrors to internet rumors, our next developer created the huge open world of Bohemia and took us on an adventure through the Holy Roman Empire. However, there have been some leaks that this action RPG may have a home on the Switch. Opal sat down with Warhorse Studios to try and get to the bottom of this. Kingdom Come Deliverance on the Switch. That is quite some news. Yes, Wait, that's true. What? Kingdom Come Deliverance is coming to the Nintendo Switch. And as you said, it's about gamers, devs, and games. In our case, or in this case, actually gamers play an integral part in the story. What do you mean? Well, some kind of confusion happened uh, in the end of last year. We, uh, we, Warhol Studios, were uh, preparing the release of the Kingdom Come Deliverance Royal Edition on PlayStation and Xbox, but someone most likely ticked the wrong box in Japan and it looked like it's going to be released on Switch as well. Of course, by that time there was nothing existing like that. We were not even thinking about the possibility that Kingdom Come Deliverance could go on the Switch. However, however Nintendo uh, Japan took this information, some Japanese media, and then the snowball started rolling. All of a sudden, it was the talk of the day. Kingdom Come Deliverance is releasing on the Switch. But as How I said, uh, nothing like that was Switch, planned at all, and uh, we didn't even think about that. Now, a few months back, and we think it's, it was still somehow cursing around in the Nintendo database, Nintendo of Spain posted a picture on um, Twitter where they had uh, different pictures of open world games and they were uh, promoting already existing open world games on the Nintendo store. And Maybe. if you clicked on the picture, actually you couldn't, there was nothing like Kingdom Come Deliverance. Of course not, because as I said, nothing like that is existing. However, again, it created confusion. People were talking about it again, like, okay, so is it coming? Is it not coming? But for us actually, 
And as I said, we didn't think about that until that time. For us, we started to think. We started to think there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of buzz. People are actually talking about us, reaching out to us. Like they seem to want Kingdom Come Deliverance on the Nintendo Switch. So we started to think. And since we are already in the Koch Media um, oh, family or the Embracer family, and there's a lot of talented studios, so is Saber Interactive. And who but them would be actually capable of uh, bringing the Kingdom Come Deliverance version on the Switch. So we sat together and now we are here talking about the Nintendo Switch version on Kingdom Come. So what you're saying is that a community of gamers made this happen? More or less, yes, the community feedback we got, of course, was a big drive for this entire project. But this comes from our general background. So think of the Kickstarter project we had in the day. So without the community, there wouldn't be any Warhol Studios or any Kingdom Come Deliverance. So we always try to be very close to them and working together with them and even coming up with crazy ideas together with them. So, uh, like for instance, sequel. the Savior Schnapps. Our own liquor uh, we created later uh, came, was actually a community idea. Uh, we have our own beer brand. We recently released um, a blue brick set, like a building set for Kingdom Come Deliverance buildings. Um, and now one of the latest projects is the Kingdom Come Deliverance soap bar, which <laughs> should give you the real medieval smell. Is In that, that case, I must say it actually medieval smells actually pretty well. And uh, we are coming up with crazy stuff like that uh, all the time. Our next new merchandise product is, or project, is a Farkle boxed board game, kind of. So what? Farkle, for those who don't know, that's like a it's Kingdom Come Deliverance mini game, a dice mini game you can play in the game. And now with Griffon Studios, we are coming up with a boxed version you can get and okay, play Farkle kind of at home against your, against your friends or against your family Does or whatever. Like so uh, that's, that's pretty cool if you ask me. Uh, but generally, if you're interested in these kind of stuff, just check the Warhol Studios social media accounts. You get all the information you need there. Ooh, Buy and bring the dream hack. Yes, Soapy yes. Soapy hot news. Oh. Speaking of soapy hot news, how do you oh. feel about Warhorse being under the new label Prime Matter? It's a huge honor, of course. Uh, we were working together with Koch for over four years already. In 2019, we then even uh, became part of the entire Embracer family. So that was a big thing. And now being able to be to take part at the is, beginning of something new, me be there the when there's a new label being created, <laughs> that is that is a big thing for us. And especially if you consider that we come there as an established partner already, that is really cool. And we are looking forward to uh, a bright future. Thank you very much, Toby. We can't yeah, no see about a sequel, what though. War Horse has got. I'm going to buy that Farkle, however. however until that time, Toby, goodbye. So are we. Thank you very much and see you. From internet rumors back to reality, we will have more on Kingdom Come Deliverance for Switch as we get it. All right, let's move from RPGs to FPS games. Final Form, which is a working title, is an action-packed sci-fi adventure where you play the role of a humanoid avatar of a sentient spaceship sent on a mission to the edge of the known universe to battle an unstoppable plague. The game is still a long ways from completion, but here's a very quick peek at what's in store. Buy the soap? No, I want the Farkle game. I used to play Killzone so much. Multi, uh, PvP man, multiplayer. <laughs> Hi, we are Raycon Games, and what you have just seen is the first glimpse of our upcoming game called the Final Form. Final Form is an action-packed, epic sci-fi FPS in which you are a female-formed humanoid machine on a space mission with no return. At the heart of the game is a mystery and alien wars to explore, but also an adrenaline-fueled combat. 
In final form, it's all about the freedom and power of movement, being a machine unrestrained by human weaknesses. Almost like Samus. There are numerous abilities and gadgets that come with your robotic body, so you can give yourself away to the fantasy of becoming an unstoppable cybernetic goddess blazing away in a spectacular ballet of destruction. Reiken is located in Warsaw, Poland, with additional team members located all over the world. The studio was founded and is managed entirely by game developers. Since the success of Ruiner, we've grown quite substantially. Currently, Reiken is over 50 brilliant game creators. And counting. We are not a huge team, but what we love to do is to evolve together with our projects, constantly finding smarter, and oh, better giggle. ways to achieve something truly unique. We build our work environment just like we make games, aiming for the best results and personal fulfillment. We strongly believe that the well-being of team members needs to be taken care of first before we can pour all of that love into a game. The partnership with Kosh Media has been very fruitful and inspiring. We're happy to be in the avant-garde of the upcoming new label. We're looking forward to share more on Final Form in the future. And in the meantime, please enjoy the rest of the show and see you around. <laughs> to say guys i love the soundtrack from final form oh, moving on to our next yeah. game which is just as special what if you took lovecraftian and gagarus themes and mixed it all together with hardcore RPG I just things. that's exactly what massive work studios are doing i got to sit down with their cto to talk about their game dolman <laughs> now to Gabrielle Fajera, CTO of Massive Work Studios, who joins us now from Campinas near São Paulo in the southeast of Brazil. So, Gabrielle, what is Dolman about? First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here and to participate. Well, so let me tell a little bit about what Dolman is. Dolman is that kind of game that where the hero needs to save everyone from, from an alien threat. Uh, fighting with all kinds of monsters and struggling to keep going forward. Yeah, that's the kind of, the kind of game that Domain is not about. In this game, you actually save oh, the Dwellers, which is the word. alien species that live on the planet, but you're going there to help a company save its investment. So you're not really the, the nice guy that's trying to save everyone. It's just a job. But we hope to, that the players uh, consider the humanity, the greed, the war, and the spares and the challenges that come to mind uh, along with that job. Uh, taking all that part, and yes, Domain is also about f fighting all kinds of monsters and, and struggling. After all, uh, it is a hard game. It's a hardcore game. It's uh, inspired on souls like, so yes, you're going to die a lot. The barcode awesome. scanning. Thank you. Work. So oh. when thinking about the name Dolman, obviously you guys went that for went for that for like a very specific reason. What's the thinking behind the name? Why did you go for Dolman? So uh there was many things that came to our mind when describing the name of the game. Uh 
uh, domain, which means a single chamber uh, uh, tomb, a megalithic tomb. Uh, we thought it would be a good word to describe this tomb, uh, this crystal that we have that is related to that. In many ways, uh, everyone that deals with this crystal in the game is close to being, bringing problems to everyone that is around. And uh, we wanted this to be the main piece of the game. Cool. Awesome. And now I know that people may or may not have heard of Dolmen before, so um, it is already out there in the world. But how long has it taken to get to this point? Oh, it, it's been a long journey since the beginning of the project. We started at uh, late 2016, so uh, it's been almost five years now. And probably uh, uh, just a bit more till it come out. Uh, but we, uh, and about our journey, uh, if it wasn't the support that we had, uh, since the beginning, uh, either our community, the Kickstarters and you guys, uh, I believe. We yeah, it's on Steam. I tried to scan in the back. Right. Lovely. Um, how have you been inspired by other games? You mentioned like the Souls-like obviously inspires it. You know, are there other games that inspire you? And also what games do the teams like? First of all, regarding inspirations, uh, a lot of games came to, came to us when we were producing the game and when we were first thinking of it. Obviously, we are really passionate and we really love Souls-like games, so Bloodborne, uh, Dark Souls, uh, those games were our main inspirations. But we drew uh, we drew inspirations from all different kind of sources. So we had inspirations in Dead Space and Mass Effect, uh, uh, and also not only inspirations in game in other games, but also inspirations in, in movies and Lovecraftian stories. Uh, for example, Alien and Geiger, and those were our main inspirations about games that we most like and games that our team uh, likes. It, it's really hard to say because we have a team that ranges from uh, liking uh, Dota to CS and Souls-like games. But what I can really tell you is that uh, everyone of our team is passionate about the project because they lo uh, love doing what they do, which is uh, a hardcore game. Yeah, and that makes That's sense as well when you get hands on Dolmen, out there, all man. these inspirations that have come in. So the game is set in a sci-fi universe. Is there any specific reason you decided to go down that route? Was there any other routes that you considered at first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the humans are afraid of what they don't know. And the universe has infinite possibilities. There is always something unknown that we can explore in space. Uh, so that sci-fi sci setting really uh, was uh, something that we could use to throw everything that our insane minds could come with. Uh, so we wanted to use the sci-fi as a tool to reach this goal, to present the player uh, a world of unknown that he can fear and he can enjoy it <laughs> no absolutely and um while we're kind of on the on the point of humans and earth um you guys are based in brazil which is awesome uh are there any specific challenges that you face during development there. because of that or just in general yeah there were a lot of challenges that we faced uh, along this five-year journey uh we obviously had yes, to adapt do. our workflow in this late years in the late years uh so 2020 and 2021 21 uh was a really challenge for us but it was something that we could adapt well especially because even that we uh, we're based in brazil we're not only based in a single location in brazil we have people uh spread across the country so it, it was uh, easy enough to to overcome that challenge, but there were several challenges since uh, getting development kits and finding uh, finding uh, people that are really capable of helping us to deliver 
this amazing game. And that's what we, uh, we gather. And that's something that our company uh, appreciates the most and really gives value is the people that we work with. Uh, they were really incredible people and they were really rare over here. Absolutely. That's, that's really cool. Um, kind of on that theme of development and, and challenges, um, given how development and technology often dictates how a game evolves throughout its development, how kind of close are you to the original concept that you guys came up for, for Dolman? Well, uh, there are different point of views on, on, on that answer, especially because we, we started uh, really small in the journey of the game. For example, it started as a concept from uh, a few friends that get together and they uh, brainstormed it for months, the game. Uh, so it, it diverged in two senses. And one of them, when we first thought of the game, game was is huge and is insane and has a lot of background on it it, it, it has it a, all this universe around it so a lot of it has been built so people that loves lore and loves uh the, the universe that we are creating they will have a lot to explore on that side but the game and it, from its original concept evolved a lot, especially uh, now that we have more tools at our disposal. So on the tech, the tech side, uh, it advanced way better than we imagined. Uh, back 2016, we didn't have all the resources that we have now. So of course we made some sacrifices here and there and in order to uh, achieve our goal, but we were never happy uh, uh, with uh, satisfy the, that point of satisfaction, you know, we, we want to reach more at the end of the day, uh, uh, this is also a game and we are having fun, but on top of all, we want to make a brilliant game for, for the player. Absolutely. And speaking about like making the game and the development of the game, um, seeing as you are lead programmer as well, what was the hardest part of making the actual game? I, I believe that, um, uh, we, we could have uh, gone into uh, different uh, options, uh, especially, for example, we could have uh, wanted to make it a, a game that was simpler or smaller or not have that many hours of gameplay. Uh, but we decided to go to a, a hardcore game, even though it's a first game of, of our company. So we decided to go full in into that challenge. We faced a, a lot of challenges. As I, uh, as I mentioned previously, but I believe the hardest part of the game was finding the correct uh, professionals and focusing on, on what we were doing and, you know, keeping yourself focused for five years on a, a, a single game is something that is challenging for everyone, especially right now. Uh, so it, it was a, a, a difficult decision, but we wanted to make that. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding programming uh, and, and as, a, as a programmer, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> that I could talk, keep talking and talking about uh, what is the harder. Multiplayer is always uh, challenging, uh, but finding that, that balancing fit, uh, so the game that uh, is not unfair but it is, it is, it's hard. So we wanted to aim hardcore players. So this was really something that, that was hard. So you mentioned like five years of development, which is a crazy long time. Oh. How, how have um. you kept yourself motivated? How have the team kept themselves motivated? I won't say that it was easy uh, because it wasn't, but I, I would say that most of all, we were always having this, and these meetings uh, in order to play the game, even now that we are remote, we keep uh, to, uh, getting up uh, every day and making a meeting and show, showcasing what we are doing and working alongside each one of us. Uh, also, a, a lot of things that happened during before, before COVID uh, was the events. The events always made us super ha happy. So showcasing the game to everyone 
and getting the players to play the game and see how they react. It was something incredible for us. Uh, it really made us feel proud of what we were doing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I feel like everyone's chosen, missing yeah. that event feeling, right? When you actually get to see people on the games and you're like, oh, wow, everyone's loving our games. I think it's something that everyone is is missing, definitely. Speaking of kind of motivation and happy times, what are you most proud of of this game? What have you guys worked on that you're like, yeah, we did that? I believe that the universe, uh, the universe that we created is amazing it has a lot of background from it uh so for example uh we even made uh, some comics for it uh that, that we prepared uh we had a lot we have a lot of story uh some crazy cinematics so we're really proud of the universe that we created uh this game that, that we made uh, and achieving what we did uh is what makes us feel proud and now that we have partnered with you, uh, getting to expand that universe and getting to uh, get closer to our original concept and what we meant for it, uh, that is something that makes us really happy. Cool. Awesome. Speaking of partnership with us, what are the benefits of signing up with a global publisher like Koch on their brand new label? Uh, that that that's really uh, that's that's really a, a, a amazing feeling for us. Uh, Koch really helped us and takes care of the uh, all, all of the operation that we couldn't make it make it for ourselves. Uh, they have an amazing uh, team of QA uh, localization, so we can reach uh, uh, different countries and players everywhere. Uh, we have a great producer that worked with us, uh, helping us reaching, reach our goals and, and really deliver the game that we want. And without Koch, Koch op opened the doors for us on, on that sense. And being part of this new label is, is a great opportunity for, for us. Uh, and also to, to know uh, other game developers and expand the, the game community. And yeah, and, and to meet you uh, as well. Uh, we, we really uh, uh, thank you for this oppor opportunity. Absolutely. We are so happy to have you guys on board. Um, and more importantly, I am so excited to actually let people play this game at some point under this new label. So thank you so much for your time, Gabrielle. It's been awesome talking to you. And yeah, let's um, release Dolman at some point <laughs> under the new label. Thank you for your time and see you later. Thank you. See ya. Now, the first title from Prime Matter will be the beautiful, highly anticipated King's Bounty 2. We have a first look at the gameplay trailer, and then Opal got a chance to sit down and talk with CEO Nikolai Barishnikov. The balance is off. Don't lament me. Our land, Nostria, dances on the knife's edge of fate. King Claudius, my father, cannot lead, and his absence has set the realm in motion. Something is coming. Now the burden of the crown falls on to me. Nostria was flourishing, but there is unrest. It's very loud, yeah. It used to be beautiful here. Hell, man. My Come wife on. and I had a nice life then. Conspiracy, sabotage, necromancy. They all threaten this land asunder. But we must unite, for distorted terrors are advancing. Rumors tell of a false prophet putting our hope in something that does not exist. A seer foretells that our savior is among us. People of Nostria, oh, yeah. you laid faith in my father. Do so to me. We must look towards the horizon, fight back the darkness, and preserve the light of our land for Nostria. Switch to. 
Yeah, man, that previous- Hello there, guys. Thanks for joining me. One. And I am joined by Nikolai Berinshnikov from 1C Entertainment, oh, who is Christ. CEO and creator of King's Bounty 2. So King's Bounty has been years in development and has a 30 year pedigree. So what is it that makes King's Bounty 2 so special? The original King's Bounty uh, uh, was a grandfather of games like, of series like Heroes of Might and Magic. So it created these turn-based gameplay when you have a uh, hex-based battlefield and the troops are moving in turns. Um, uh, they, you know, like chess, chess pieces uh, on the board. So I think that's that's uh, the key, uh, the cornerstone uh, of um, uh, King's Bounty. Absolutely, and kind of speaking about that, and um, I know the, as you mentioned, the first King's Bounty was 1990, and then you had your, like, the King's Bounty that you guys created in the 2000s. What technical improvements now that we're in 2021, are you most excited about implementing into the new King's Bounty 2? Well, I'm a huge uh, fan of the core uh, aspect the of the game. King's Bounty 1 have battles. multiplayer? And uh, if in the previous games, um, the battlefield was always a flat surface, so now we're bringing the battlefield into 3D. I've so never played have, that, so... you know, line of sights, uh, you know, heels, uh, you know, like simple example, if, if your archers the arena? are allocated on the hill, they will do like extra damage for the high ground, etc. So mm -hmm. moving the battlefield to 3D, 3D is, is a huge uh, uh, step forward. And then the whole uh, role-playing part, the exploration part, we decided to move more towards um, uh, games like, uh, you know, Fable or Mass Effect kind of, you know, yeah. epic, uh, big uh, role-playing games, as opposed to have a top-down kind of isometric view, of, you know, tiny little character on the course, just uh, galloping around um, uh, the map. So we are moving towards this kind of epic uh, fantasy adventure uh, because this is this is not like a small. I'll tell you what it means after the show. Chat. This is one of one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, production uh, we've done in Moscow uh, uh, so far. So speaking of the other King's Bounty games, will this King's Bounty two follow the other stories of the games, or will it be a standalone title? Um, no, the game will not follow on uh, any previous games. Uh, but <clears throat> even the previous King's Bounty, they all sort of like disconnected. There was like yeah. the main protagonist, there are a bunch of like, you know, evil guys. There's like a um, uh, small quest. And I would say that um, a previous King's Bounty uh, it was not like an epic RPG adventure. Uh, so the game was more about just battling uh, random monsters on the map uh, mm -hmm. and uh, solving some little uh, quests. And then King's Bounty 2 is really, you know, a epic adventure. Uh, we had spent like dozens of hours solving puzzles, working with different functions, making decisions that change the character and the world. So we're really moving much more uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, an epic RPG. However, uh, this is a rare combination uh, where our game, King's Bounty, is not an action RPG. It's not a Witcher game mm -hmm. where you have to, you know, quickly press buttons on your joysticks and battle uh, uh, enemies in the field. It's interesting crossbreed of a high fantasy uh, role playing game with a tactical um, uh, strategy uh, title, which. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, it's not like quote unquote was never done on console, but this is fairly unique uh, combination uh, for the console. And uh, for me, like a great inspiration was uh, was modern remake of uh, XCOM, for example, uh, because I was a huge fan of XCOM that was released in 1994, 1996. And the modern console uh, uh, reinvented of XCOM. This is mm -hmm. something we're trying to achieve with King's Bounty, really make a modern game that works well on modern platforms, that uh, works well with current understanding of gamers, how a game should look like. So yeah. um, we're trying to enhance it in uh, every possible direction. Yeah, cool, awesome. Kind of speaking about the story of King's Bounty 2 and how it differs, it appears to have a darker, more gritty aesthetic compared to its predecessors. What was the design philosophy around that? Why did you decide to go with that instead? That's an interesting question. We've been debating uh, on, uh, on the design approach. Uh, and again, as I said, we, we spent a lot of time prototyping, uh, working on the core gameplay and the looks and the art of the game. Uh, previous game had this more cartoonish, uh, kind of uh, fancy uh, indie look, but we decided that we are now trying to play in different league. We're trying to make a you know, much bigger title, a big game, an epic adventure. 
Uh, we've been, um, you know, astonished by, you know, modern fantasy. It's 90 minutes. In uh, Nini. And um, in games. And we thought that this, this is a good idea, actually, to upgrade King's Bounty to what we call like high fantasy or like realistic fantasy. So it's not a dark fantasy like Kingdom Come when they're like, you know, very peasants, everything is bad. No, it's more like, as I said, like high fantasy. Uh, you know, epic uh, characters. It is a dragon. It looks like a dragon, not like a toy. It is a villain. You know, he or she looks like a real bad person. So that that was the, the main philosophy. Plus, um, you know, game development evolves, and I don't think that it's a good idea to you know take a game of 2008 and just mm -hmm. make a replica with slightly enhanced graphics in um, 2021. So yeah. you need, especially for consoles, uh, there's a specific- I have my alert to um, pass, I see him though. I'll play him after this. From somebody uh, coming to the store or buying the game digitally or online, okay, this is like a 49.59 game. Uh, it has to look graphically and gameplay wise like this, there's an expectation. And we believe that that's, that's what we had to do. Yeah, so we've mentioned that this game combines yeah, so we've different mentioned kind of play, place like ways that you can play the game. Basically, you know, from third person RPG elements to this unique unique fighting system, this kind of chess like fighting system. Um, kind of, why did you choose? You know, with the evolution of game design and how people play games, why did you choose to stick I open this stream to these again, hybrid the game mechanics? Do you think that this is kind of what makes King's Bounty, King's Bounty? Uh, absolutely. I think you got it spot on, so I don't even need to answer. King's <laughs> Bounty is, 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 is you know, there's a, is a grandfather of, you know, turn-based uh, games. So if you remove tactical combat from King's Bounty, then it, it becomes, I don't know, Mass Effect or Kingdom Come. So this yeah, is, yeah. so we can, we can play around with the um, evolution of this uh, gameplay, make it uh, more fun or realistic, but obviously this this is the core. So this is this is a tactical game with a lot of uh, role playing aspects and high fantasy aspects, and not the not the other way around. So uh, again, um, uh, gamers who like uh, RPG with shooting elements, uh, you know, games like Cyberpunk, this mm -hmm. King's Bounty is probably not for them. I'm sorry, it just yeah. uh, it's a different game. Yeah, and in terms of you know, we've mentioned kind of this new 3D world that you're creating when it comes to the fighting style and then this these rpg mechanics and making this world feel more alive and more exciting what was actually the hardest part of you making the game what took the longest time what kind of caused you the most headaches hard to say again first first of all uh this multiple platform game uh so there are specific technical issues uh that's uh uh, prolong the development. If you make just, let's say, a PC title or just yeah, a PlayStation so. game, then you know yeah. you are not having a headache of uh, porting to different platforms, uh, getting different uh, you know specifications, TCRs, approvals. So that that adds uh, a lot. And then secondly, the, the production itself. As as soon as we went away from this kind of cartoonish, uh, kind of uh, you know. Uh, easy looking um, uh, isometric uh, view into a 3D high fantasy and the production of SS. So we uh, wanted to build like a huge map. We wanted to populate this map with a lot of um, uh, characters that mm -hmm. would just move around, uh, go uh, somewhere, you know, have their own like stories. Then we decided to, uh, instead of having like text dialogues, we decided to produce a lot of uh, engine-based cutscenes uh, to uh, push the story to explain what's going on. Uh, so we even had to uh, uh, buy our motion capture studio. We, you know, we worked with like a dozen of actors, and uh, there are hours and hours and hours of, uh, uh, you know, in-game-based cutscenes, um, yeah, which in the past would be just uh, dialogues and pieces of text. That that, that was another. It's hard to talk uh, about this because. Oh, no, absolutely. And then the dialogue. final question, what are the benefits of signing up with a global publisher like Koch and being on their brand new gaming label? Oh, that, that provides us um, uh, a lot of additional support uh, because, um, you know, I'm not sure that you know, all gamers understand how games uh, get to the market. So making yeah. uh, making game, you know, writing pieces of code or, you know, drawing this, uh, you know, amazing sketch of a dragon, uh, is only you know half of the puzzle. So it's like you know yin yang. Uh, you need a lot of uh, support 
uh, from production people, you know, testing, um, uh, localization, uh, uh, manufacturing uh, retail units, uh, you know, putting all this, you know, units into the retail shops uh, in the world, uh, making uh, mass uh, market communications. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so we decided to uh, uh, cooperate uh, with Coach Media, uh, that seemed to be the ideal partner. So I, you know, we are on the market for many, many years. Yeah. And uh, I would say very honestly, I was personally a bit scared if we do it just ourselves, mm -hmm. that we might not have uh, the human resources uh, to deliver uh, uh, the information about the game, the game itself, you know, we'll work with yeah. all the uh, platform uh, holders as effectively as in uh, a co-production and co-publishing uh, uh, with uh, such an esteemed uh, uh, partners, you know, you know, Coach Media Embrace Group, so I might go ahead. Awesome. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for your time, Sorry, Nikolai. So and I cannot wait for people to get their hands on King's Bounty too. Oh, me too. Trust me, me too. <laughs> After three years of development. He's using uh, the RTX yeah. green screen thing, the I most think. Exciting days Someone asked. 2021. We have 12 titles. We keep saying it. And honestly, I shouldn't have a favorite. It's like picking between a favorite child. However, this next title speaks to me on a gaming level, unlike any other. This third person action adventure shooter will keep you up at night tossing and turning with its horrific nightmarish creatures. Think Alice in Wonderland meets Alien, or as one US journalist put it, Tomb Standing. Guys, sit back, relax, grab a pillow, because you get a world exclusive look at Scars Above. Good right. job. Dr. Ward, Dr. Yoshida, get to the bridge, please. Time to see what's inside our alien guest. The thing? Come on, guys. Telemetry check. Telemetry check. Here go. How is this possible? What planet is this? How did I end up here? Well, she can breathe there. Could be worse. Log entry. The gate has an internal conduction system. The three points on the rim seem sensitive. A targeted blast of electricity should cause a reaction. Debris. It's from Hermes. It must have splintered off as it entered the atmosphere. Mira, oh, it's still intact. Yeah, Returnal vibes. What the, what the hell was that? Log entry. The creature has multiple salivary glands in its thoracic region that seem to produce a highly venomous secretion. Mm. is covered with some kind of organic residue. Looks like Robinson managed to connect the MPU to the pillar. But if you puzzle even Ella can solve, I'm fucking fine that dude, right? This will help me get through that tissue webbing. And I'm taking the MPU.
Who were the architects of this place? Did they build these towering monuments to serve a purpose, or as a testament to their might? Were they looking for answers, or solving a problem? that in the beginning of the show. This thing was huge. All footage is very alpha and very early. <laughs> what do you mean, Kofium? That's what they said in the beginning of the show. That's what we had to keep in mind. All right. <laughs> Dripping with the fluid that's freezing the water. There's the brain and the neural pathways leading to various organs. The dudo cerebrum seems to be generating an electrical charge. This neural pathway is conducting large amounts of bioelectricity. Secreting the cryogenic fluid that's freezing the water. The cocktail of digestive acids is dissolving local plant life into homogeneous matter. The process seems to be aided by bioelectricity. really was something and last week opal had a chance to talk to the developers mad head games and ask them what their game was all about hello there guys joining me now from novi sad in serbia is ivan zorkic game director at mad head games who's going to tell us all about his new project mad head games. so ivan what's scars above all about hey there uh so uh, scars above well uh, you know an alien object appears near earth and a team of astronauts is you know, sent to explore it to do a, a close range scan. However, uh, for some reason that I don't want to go into now, uh, this results in, in them like a, a, in an event which, which causes them to be transported to an unknown alien planet. So uh, our protagonist, Kate Ward, who is a mission specialist, she's an astrobiologist with a background in engineering. She's, she's one, of the, one of the members of the, of the team of astronauts, of the team called uh, SCAR team, which is uh, Sentient Contact Assessment and Response. So uh, she is uh, on the ship uh, doing the scan picture. and she ends up on this, uh, stranded on this, on this alien planet. So one moment she's with her team in, in the ship and uh, the other moment she's on this strange planet alone. So 
she explores she 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 uh, finds out that that her team is also stranded on the planet she she has to find them first uh, and it seems that some time has passed you know she it, it, you know she doesn't understand why and also the planet is very hostile so there's a bunch of dangerous creatures uh, monsters and everything seems to want to kill her and, and the rest of her crew so she she needs to you know uh, find out what's going on, solve this mystery, how did they end up here, what does this planet want from them? And, you know, the story unravels and she actually learns about the place and learns about the, 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 the mystery behind it. Uh, but it's all about, you know, like being stranded on, on this uh, kind of <laughs> scary, but also in a way strangely beautiful world. And facing a lot of nasty, nasty creatures and monsters. Yeah. So it's like kind of keeping on that theme of the realm of possibility and whatnot. How much in the game um, has its roots in the real world and how much is just playing crazy sci-fi? Well, it's it's mostly sci-fi, but the themes come from the real world. So they're they're inspired by the real world, real world. Uh, you know, I, I think the best stories come from the real world, even if they're, you know, about, as I said, dragons or, or fairy tales and, uh, of course, spaceships and, and space exploration. Like, there is always this component. So, on one level, Scars Above is about reason versus terror. And this is a very important topic to me, and that's a very real world topic for me. Like, in our world, a lot of bad things come out of fear. And uh, this fear, uh, you know, gives birth to some unreasonably dark actions, which lead to more bad things and more fear and more bad things. And uh, in a way, Scars Above is like, um, for me, a metaphor for uh, reason standing up against terror, you know, science against darkness, knowledge against ignorance. So apart from kind of staying within sci-fi and obviously that kind of opening up the possibility that this can actually happen no, I don't, makes Sally. sci-fi what it is. Is there any other kind of important <laughs> reason to you to keep, you know, that sense of realism still there in the game? So, there is, like, yes, there, there, is, there is a reason to keep realism, but I think the better word is to make it believable. So, you know, like, if you go for absolute realism, you're... you're per kind of limited on you know what 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 you can tell the story you can tell it, it's it kind of is like there is fiction element to the to the sci-fi right but we want to make it believable and the reason why this is uh, important is because I, I would like to create this what if vibe you know i would like it if people actually ask themselves like like what if this really happened what would i do if i were suddenly stranded somewhere on this strange far away from home world uh, surrounded with monsters and, and, and terrors. Like if you make this believable, uh, people might actually think more about it. So we don't want to go like super realistic, uh, but we do want to make it believable so that, uh, you know, because immersion is really important so that people get immersed True. in this world and, and start thinking like, what would I do if I was in this, in this situation, you know, and, you know, what if this was really like, what if this happens someday? What if an alien object does appear near Earth someday and yeah. what would happen? Absolutely. And then you mentioned the lead protagonist, Kate Ward. Like a rival. You told her, like, you told about her uh, job title. What else about her? You know, like, who is she? Why is she? Kate, Kate is awesome. We love her. So, so Kate is a, a, a very strong and very capable, but also a very caring person. You know, so, so she's an astronaut. She's a scientist. Uh, Rival's not bad. A, a it's team a member, movie. a colleague, an explorer. And, you know, she always has like this uh, childlike scientific curiosity. You know, but, but one thing she is not, and that's uh, a warrior, like a trained warrior. She's not a soldier. So she's not like a space commando or anything. And uh, so, and, and she does uh, end up in a situation where like she needs to, you know, fight for her life. So th th that's a theme that's kind of like really interesting to us. Uh, because, you know, the fact that she's not a trained combatant doesn't mean she's not capable, you know. So she has like a strong will, a sharp mind, and, and she's very brave and tough. But, you know, like she's under tremendous stress in, in our game. And we want to show how vulnerable she is, how scared she is, how distressed, you know. Because I like true courage uh, doesn't, you know, it doesn't come out of lack of fear. It comes in face of fear. So we do want to show this fear. 
and and it's actually like this True. the fact that she's overcoming this like fighting her emotions fighting uh, you know all the stress that that makes her courageous and that that's great so, so she gets frightened you know she fights her the emotions overrated? Uh, no she's way. acceptable to panic uh, which i i think kind of makes her relatable like she's not like you know uh, you know I'm, I'm all out of gum i'm I, i'm kicking ass and chewing bubble gum and i'm all out of gum you know like that's that's not her she's she is like uh you know she her heart heart pounds her voice breaks, she trembles, you know, but then, and th th that's, that's what I really like. Like when, when her voice breaks, when she's like really scared, but she like clenches her fist and, you know, the adrenaline kicks in and she pushes through, you know, no matter the obstacle. And she does it using her mind, you know, and using science and using her cunning to, you know, craft these weapons and, and, and gadgets and, 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 and survive against the odds. Awesome. So you mentioned, uh, that you know, Kate's a team player, and and that Scar gets sent up. Who else is in the team? Who else are we going to be um, meeting on this adventure? So, so she's uh, she's uh, a part of of a four person <sighs> team. Uh, there is uh, the, the the commander of the of the mission, Commander Robinson, Richard Robinson, and he is like a, you know like he, a, a, a a person with a military background, like a pilot and and a, you know an an officer, and like she he is the commander after all. But the, the rest of the team are mission specialists, you know, because they and this is also kind of like the idea that uh, we like it's Great, this alien object appears, we send right scientists and explorers trying to figure what's going on. So so Kate is joined. Uh, by by her uh, close friend Tamara, who is who is uh, and also like a, a scientist and an astronaut, and uh, and by Mike, uh, a, a little bit younger member of the team, but who is also like a communications expert, and like they they they're, they're they're all scientists working working together to solve this mystery. But Kate does get separated from them, and and you know part of the game is actually uncovering the fate of her uh, other team members, and you know like. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, Kate obviously cares a lot uh, about, about uh, her her teammates and her friends. Speaking of best feelings that you can have, what are you most proud of up to date of Scars Above? I'm I'm actually gonna give you a corny but very true answer. I'm I'm most proud of of the team. So like making a game is is a huge effort. Not and corny, it requires though. a lot of hard work, uh, focus, energy, dedication but also like cooperation, communication, support. So it's just, just like looking at a group of people working together on, on a common goal, that, that's really inspiring. And I think that's truly the case with any development team. Like when you ask them like what you're more proud, most proud of, you know, and I, I keep thinking like one, one day in the far future, I may actually forget some of the details during the development, but I will always remember the people I worked with. That's awesome. And then last question, what are the benefits of signing up with a global publisher like Koch and being on their brand new uh, publishing label? There's a bunch of benefits, but like, you know, having access to certain resources, to, to experience. Uh, this is a game, you know, uh, with many firsts for us. So having someone to just didn't like, show any uh, you know, share thoughts footage, and, no. and share the experience is really valuable. But, you know, on a personal level, I, I have to say this, and I'm being perfectly honest, like the biggest benefit for me uh, was meeting a bunch of great people on your side. And I truly mean this, like uh, uh, it's it's a continuing pleasure to re work with you, uh, n not just, uh, you know, not just talking about the game or how we can make it better, but, you know, just like we talk a lot, lot as you know, like we, we chat about various things. Just meeting uh, you guys, like it's a, it's a tremendous boost to what we're doing. Uh, and, and you know, I don't want to. I don't want to downplay like the the obvious benefits because there's a lot of them, like the you know the, the infrastructure, the resources. But you know, uh, for me personally, it's, it's just like meeting and, and getting to hang out with you guys. That's that's really awesome. Absolutely, and it's a pleasure to hang out with you as well, Ivan. And thank you so much for your time. I cannot wait to let people play Scars Above because I know that we have so much fun with it uh, in the office. So thank you very much. And yeah, we can't wait to see more. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to people playing uh, the game. I'm, we're really excited about it. So, and thank you for this uh, talk, yeah. And now for something completely different. When Brian Fargo himself, the granddaddy of top-down isometric RPGs, says he is excited about a game, that's gotta mean Prime Matter is getting something right. 
Encased is an isometric dystopian sci-fi RPG scheduled for release this autumn. And this new trailer, which we're unveiling today, should give you a pretty good flavor of what the game is all about. It's 1976, and the future has arrived. But here's the skinny. We at Cronus need you. Cronus was formed after a dome-like structure was discovered five years ago. Was it from our ancient past? Was it made by aliens? Does it run on perfectly harmless nuclear power? We need to know. And humanity is waiting for you to help unlock its secrets. Descend into the dome itself and join one of our incredible research teams. The only question is, which wing of Cronus is the best fit for you? If you like taking orders, cracking heads, ultraviolence, and guns, lots of guns, then the Black Wing is for you. Can you build and repair incredible technology, but not expect any credit for it? You sound like an engineer to us. Welcome to the Blue Wing. Are you a doctor, scientist, mathematician, or any other type of brainiac? We've got you covered in the White Wing. Do you like taking credit for the hard work of others, but never do anything yourself? Those forms won't fill themselves. That's management, mister. And the Silver Wing awaits. Are you a criminal, prisoner, or have no discernible skills whatsoever? <laughs> then you're coming to the Orange Wing, like it or not. Are you ready for adventure? Are you ready to make the change with us? Are you ready to love it so much that you'll never want to leave? Then join Cronus and take the second giant leap for mankind under the dome. That's not all. Opal got to sit down with the creative brains behind Encased. Check it out. Let's go to St. Petersburg in Russia and speak to Vyacheslav Kosahin, creative director of Dark Crystal Games and the brains behind their upcoming isometric RPG Encased. So, Slava, what is Encased? So Encased is an old school RPG in the sci-fi post-apocalyptic setting, basically. Awesome. So the name encased is kind of, you know, it's a word and, and it has various meanings. What's the thinking behind the name? Uh, the thinking behind the name comes from the, actually the setting of the game from one main entity of it, which is the dome. Uh, the game takes place in the anomalous zone co called the dome. Uh, which uh, was found somewhere in the last uh, unknown desert uh, on the Earth and uh, on our planet. And well, basically people who get in there, various scientists, uh, technicians, soldiers and adventurers, they uh, no can't get true. back. Uh, this is sort of a one-way road. So th uh, those guys who explore the, the dome, they are encased in there, which I, I think makes some sense in this regard. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So um, I know that you guys have been developing this game for, for kind of a long time now. How long has it actually taken to get to the point where you are now? So we are developing the game for three and a half years now. We started late in 2017 with some pre-production. But uh, chat, obviously, we have thoughts about a project like this for years and years before that, before they, those crystallized in something, uh, you know, something that really exists. So it takes 10 years of thinking behind this game, this project, and three and a half years of actual production time to this, to this time, to this point. So considering how long it takes, how do you guys keep yourself so motivated just on one like particular title? Well, we don't, uh, we can't say we have any problems with motivation or our own because uh, for most, if not everyone on the team, this is the dream project that, uh, you know, comes to life. So that's, that's fine in this regard. The motivation is uh, always high, but also we are in the early access and we were really open with the community from the uh, very early yeah, stages of the project. After this misery. And because of this openness and uh, talks with the community and we have a, had a crowdfunding and that now we are 
in, in about the 10 early minutes. access, we have this constant feedback on the project, both positive and sometimes negative. Uh, which obviously keeps us motiv motivated. Uh, if we would be on our own for, the, for those like three and a half years and uh, some extra time we'll uh, spend on developing this game, maybe the motivation could decline a little bit, but with the, those constant talks with the community, uh, shared feedback, we're all good. Awesome. And then kind of bringing it back to the game, given how um, development and technology often is, is basically dictates how the game evolves throughout its development. How close to the original concept that you came up with years and years ago are you now with the game that you have currently? Uh, the overall game. concept, uh, we managed to keep it, uh, keep it alive. We, keep, we managed to keep it true. It's a very... A uh, very old school CRPG type uh, game, which uh, which in is inspired by many golden classics of uh, late 90s and early 2000s, and in that regard, it uh, all you know all those ideas survived through the pro process, which is really great. Uh, most of the mechanics, abilities, perks, and uh, all those little uh, things which these uh, RPGs have bu built uh, from, we managed to put it in there too. But obviously, uh, because technology changed and even you know, time passes, some. Uh, less important things i'd say like maybe graphics or maybe art style beats or maybe some topics and themes we explore those uh, you know transformed and changed during the process because making games and uh, rpgs particularly it's an iterative process and takes many iterations to figure out what is the like the heart what is the idea you want to bring to the players so those transformed and crystallized during this long development but the original concept the very I can't heart talk of about it, this because it, it's, it's constant falling interview, there, so. which is really great yeah so speaking about the concept what's the actual narrative of encased uh, the story of encased is a story about exploring this anomalous zone the dome uh, the player starts as an employee of this Cronus organization, which is the only organization that <laughs> controls entire dome research and studying. Uh, there are five departments My which are called wings. A player can start in, what which like affects the game a lot the, and the story of the game. This is the Black Wing, which are the security and police services. There are White Wing, which are scientists and uh, medics. There is the Silver Wing, which are the management and uh, you know ruling um, wing of the of the of the dome of the Cronus. There are Blue Wing, which are technicians and engineers, and there is this special Orange Wing, which is contain, con contains ex-convicts which were freed to, to, to go to the dome to do man various manual labor. So you've mentioned that the game is set in the early 70s. Not many games have been set in that time period. What prompted you to pick that specific time period? Well, we think then the 70s is the perfect time for, for, for like our game, yes. for what we are doing, because 70s is like the last uh, tick on the on the timeline of the humanity while there were some blind spots on the on the planet uh, first satellites and first people in space they uh, it's all happened in late 50s and early 60s right? Don't and danger. and uh, that's my favorite 70s that's is uh, the last uh, hard soulsborn game spot on the timeline when there are some you know uh, when satellites do, do not uh, have this complete web sur surrounding the gate uh, the earth and uh, the planet and there are some blind spots where uh, such an amazing and uh, dangerous place like dome can be hidden and from that that place from that time the story takes its alternative path 
instead of going uh, further to the space, humanity sort of descends into the dome to, to study it and to do those scientific researches and do, do those miraculous discoveries basically. Yeah, so you mentioned that this is kind of like a almost a parallel universe. Um, how far did you deviate from what like actually happened in the 70s compared to what happens in the game? I guess it's it, seeing as you said that it devolves, it's quite a bit. Yeah, obviously. So the main topic would be obviously that instead of continuing the Cold War, uh, the West and the East, uh, if we can call those, uh, they instead start to explore the ideas of like internationalism and exploring the dome together and forming that uh, super corporation Cronus, which is actually the um, uh, only foundation that uh, that uh, explores the dome come, controls they only, uh, they all the it researches for... and uh, controls the flow of like artifacts and scient scientific researches <laughs> which uh, comes from the dome into the well the rest of the world and yeah those uh, the, uh, those ideas are quite different from what happened in the in the real world i, I guess and kind of bringing it back to the real world almost. Obviously, you guys are based in Russia and life in the 70s was very different than life was in the West. Um, how much of that do you think translates to, to an in international audience once we get out there? And how much do you think people won't understand because they just, you know, no one kind of really lived the, over there or no one really knew what was happening over there? Oh, as I said, I think the game yeah, Kingdom Come uh, turns to the ideas of internationalism game. when and very then... different parties across so... the world could put their own struggles, political and other struggles aside uh, to humanity become something uh, something bigger when, it, when it's combined with uh, everyone uh, is united together to, you know, ex to, to, to ascend to be something more and to explore the dome, its dangers and its discoveries, basically. Absolutely. Now bringing it kind of back to you guys and the developers again. Um, you, you mentioned that you were inspired by, by other games. What games ha like really, truly inspired it? Not just games, but media. And also, what do Fallout. you and the team like as well when it comes to video games? Fallout. Well, we are here all the you know, hardcore RPG fans. So it's not not secret why we, I suppose, picked up a project like this to develop. And it's not a secret that uh, the game is mo uh, it's in a very hard way was inspired by the Fallout series. Well, and the other great RPG games of late 90s and early 2000s and some modern ones too, actually. So speaking about development, um, what was the hardest part of making the game for you guys? Uh, I think uh, the easier question would be what was the easy part. I can't really come with, uh, with, with much things which were easy. It's, 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 all, um, it's an everyday struggle in a way. It's a marathon, uh, but it's a, it's a happy marathon and it's a happy, happy everyday struggle basically for us. Absolutely. And then moving it into that more positive thing, the happy marathon. What are you most proud of when it comes to Incast? Uh, I'm obviously the team, the team. proud of the, both the team fans. and the yes. project itself because uh, both us here in the team and our community, we often forget that three and a half years ago there was nothing, there was emptiness, nothing existed. And here, now, three and a half years later, uh, both with the team effort and the feedback which we get from the community, there is this great universe, a curious world, which is almost ready to be explored and to be adventured in, inside, basically. And then moving on to the last question, what are the benefits of signing up with a global publisher like Koch Media and being on their new label? So we think that signing with a partner as Coach Media is really great because it not only benefits us as developers, but it, uh, such partnership also benefits our community, our players. We as the developers, we 
get more time to work on the project and uh, polish it so it would be in the perfect state while our uh, players will uh, enjoy is more localizations uh, which will make the game more accessible to the wider audience we'll get the uh, voiceover done uh, which m just make the game better and bring it on some other higher level from an isometric dystopian sci-fi rpg to our next title which is a fresh oh. take on the action adventure genre this team, all the way from Iceland, specifically built a mocap studio for this title and has the incredible talent, Aldous Hamilton, as their lead protagonist. I got to sit down with was, guys chat. and ask them, what is this game all about? So Echoes of the End is a, a, cin a cinematic, narrative-driven action-adventure game uh, about Rin, uh, a, a person who has trained all her life to be a warrior in service to a throne and is now searching and finding her own right? identity nothing like this. Uh, as she's cast away from the life she's always known. Uh, it's a game we've wanted to, <laughs> to make all our lives, basically. And for us, what we really wanted to explore was a marriage of a cinematic experience and uh, the narrative choice-driven storytelling awesome. of RPGs. Uh, finding that bridge and union is what really inspired us to go and make our own video game. Exactly. And, and such a big integral part of the experience is how you as a player choose to interact with the characters around you, the different companions, the, the characters that you'll run into when you're going about in the game and uh, trying to solve all the issues that, the player will be, that you'll be facing as a player. What was the inspiration behind it? We're at a remarkable point in the game industry where, you know, a relatively small team is able to tackle such an ambitious vision and it's actually reasonable. And I think we've just recently arrived at that point. You know, there have been some really great games making leaps in the past <laughs> few years, kind of paving the way for this as the tools and hardware and software get more accessible and affordable for smaller developers. Uh, we kind of, you know, in the early days of Midgood, we came to realize that a game like this might be possible. And it seemed unreal to us that it might be at the time. Uh, but, you know, growing the team and building up the tech and in-house, like you know, uh, we saw that this was, in fact, possible. And it's an absolute uh, dream for everyone at the company to, you know, be privileged enough to work on a game like this and to uh, really shape uh, the game that we all want to make. Yeah, so kind of sticking on that point of development and how technology often drives the direction of how a game evolves throughout its development, how close to the original concept is the game now? That's a really good question. Uh, so it's 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 rather close. Like, uh, I would say how we didn't really do the left any one? large pivots. Uh, we did make some changes, of course, as the vision how evolved and like as we this? understood better kind of what the game was going to be and kind of how we scoped it to fit a team uh, that would be able to execute on it. But I think, you know, we were always, uh, you know, from day one that the idea for the game kind of conceptualized, we were looking at the the technology that was allow us to make this game, you know, going for really, you know, realistic <laughs> and stunning visuals, you oh, know, yeah, digital yeah. doubles for characters, scanned environments, you know, you know next gen, uh, development engines, next-gen uh, game engines, kind of all those things were in place for us to make the game. I think the, the primary things that have changed in the making of the game we have a are for more this? in the details of the execution of that, Let's how go. we structure the story, uh, what kind of game mechanics we want in a game like that, yeah. and, and really what the identity of our game is and how we separate that from other games. We genuinely have been making this game. This game, even though it is slightly different, Yeah my work as, as narrative director has not had to change a lot. Exactly. Yeah. We've mentioned, obviously, uh, at the start and throughout yeah, what we've spoke yeah. about so far, that you guys are based in Iceland and everyone knows the like picturesque scenery of Iceland. Did you get much inspiration from your homeland in the environment? Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, Iceland, it's such a phenomenal place to live in and it's a beautiful country that's been featured in, you know, I would love many to go films visit and, and video someday. games before us. And the funny thing is that us growing up in Iceland, this is normalcy for us. This is what we've been used to. It, it isn't until we visit other countries that we realize that the rest of the world isn't a fantasy land. Oh my God, trees! <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, 
So, uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's absolutely inspired by Iceland. And you know, I was working as a tour guide for the longest time, and a lot of us like grew up in the country from different locations, and we pulled from those locations in the game. And and even for some of them, we have yeah, I'm gonna visit there replicas someday. of them, you know, in the game. And but the in game the itself isn't springs. based in Iceland, of no. course. Uh, we're just taking inspiration from the more fantasy level uh, yeah. vistas and visuals. That, Be because yeah. while all this is true, while we love Iceland and while we'd be fools not to u utilize the access we have to Icelandic natural like, phenomena to scan and, and take references from, we don't want to make a game about Vikings uh, because yeah. it's something that's you know, been done a lot and we yeah. really want to make a unique IP that is ours yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and that no one has seen before. Yeah, and we kind of touched on, on characters, and, and you mentioned the main character at the very start. Tell us about her. Tell us, you know, why, what made you choose her? Why does she exist the way that she exists? I'll hand that one off to you, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's always a tricky question to answer without getting into any sort of spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, Rin is, uh, as I say, she is a character, a person trained from birth to be a weapon in service to the crown. Uh, I was really fascinating in exploring the difference between a person that is uh well the juxtaposition between purpose and they haven't shown any trailer or gameplay no and rin it's is a like character burdened games. by purpose and chained to it she is has been given a purpose not of her own choosing not by her own volition but one that she has inherent to her birth and very existence uh throughout this game in particular we want to explore the journey of going beyond that purpose and going beyond what role you are born into and seizing the <laughs> the world by the throat, basically. Uh, and I, I would I would say that she's born with certain powers that make her both a, a pariah and I don't know why uh, that a uniquely powerful individual. But with that power come certain challenges and certain uh, superstitions that she's challenged to overcome. I think that's general enough to avoid spoilers. Yeah, Would I you mean, like to add to that? and it, it, you know, just to add a layer to that, I think with the main character, she's, you know, throughout the game, you're constantly meeting new people. Kind of, we're setting her in. You know, we start with her familiar setting, her kind of role in society, and her kind of what what's expected of her, and and we kind of break free from that throughout the game as we meet different characters and and Rin kind of finds her own path. And, and purpose, like Magnus spoke on. And I think that's really where the player also steps in and, and kind of forms those new relationships that Rin forms throughout the game and really is uh, uh, an effector on those. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what really heightens uh, Rin as a character in the game is the performance by the excellent uh, actress behind her, who is Altis Amma Hamilton, who is absolutely phenomenal at portraying such a so it's an awesome character. What's the hardest part of game development so far? I know you guys are still in, de in the development, but what's been the most challenging? The most challenging part of game development? Uh, I think that's a different answer for every uh, team. Yes, I think that's a different answer for every game, and I think it even might be a different answer for every team member, uh, yeah. depending mm -hmm. on the different uh, perspective that they have into the game development. I think mm -hmm. for us, you know, it's been vitally important to find the right people to work on the game. Uh, and that's a really difficult thing to do, finding the right people who you believe in and who are that, you know, really passionate about making games like this. And mm -hmm. we've been lucky enough to find the right people so far. And we have, you know, exceptionally talented people on board with us making this game. And I think while that is, you know, often uh, from the outset, it's an invisible part of game development, but it's absolutely mm -hmm. essential and extremely difficult. Yeah, so you kind of mentioned before that, um, you know, Iceland's quite small. D does that mean that you guys kind of struggle to find that talent um, that's out there? Or is it quite rich in terms of game development? So uh, as usual, uh, Iceland is excellent per capita. Uh, <laughs> we we're the best at everything per, per capita. And among those in, this, in the Nordics, we have the most developers per capita. Uh, that's not really a useful metric when you look at the fact that we're only like 300,000 people, basically a small fisherman, uh, fisher town someplace. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we, Iceland is completely unique in the way that CCP, uh, another pretty well-known developer here in Iceland, kind of paved the way for all the other uh, game developers here that are now thriving. 
Uh, yeah. We have a great need to application go to infrastructure yeah. that you know pretty much covers all the different fields of game development here in Iceland. Uh, so we have exceptional talent coming out. And so I think, you know, considering the size, we have great access to talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, another part of it is that we've had a lot of Icelanders who <laughs> got into game development, game development early and uh, moved to other countries and then moved back with a lot of experience helping new teams form and, and build games here. So while it's definitely a challenge to uh, find people in a smaller nation, uh, we're blessed by the fact that we do have exceptional talent here and we have an educational system that is actively each year graduating uh, new students who know game development. What Haltor is saying is that we're a nation of nerds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and like another per capita is that, you know, I don't know, it's it's an incredibly high number of people in Iceland who play games at all ages. Yep. Like an insanely high number. Yeah, that's really crazy. And, you know, we've kind of mentioned what's the most difficult part about game development, but what are you most proud of up until this point? <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer because there's so many things. I mean, making games is, uh, you know, you it takes uh, so many people to do so many things for it to go correctly. And I think what we're most proud of is that so far we yeah, seem to shows be doing up from it correctly. Time. Uh, with yep. the great people. So I think what we're most proud of is the team and the progress that we made with this team. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good answer in general, that just the talent we've collected around us and the friendships that have formed so strongly within this company, Yeah, uh, I think that's invaluable and is what's going to drive it forward. And then finally, guys, what are the benefits of signing up with a global, global publisher like Koch Media and being part of their brand new label? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> so obviously, we touched on the part that we're uh, kind of stuck in Iceland. So our outreach <laughs> is quite limited on an island in the sea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but all jokes aside, the main benefits is that it's an extension of the team and it's a great extension of the team. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk about the things that have been the most difficult and that's building the team and the things that we're most proud of, which is, again, uh, the team that we built. And for us, Koch is a fantastic extension to the team. Uh, you know, it's a publisher full of great people who are really passionate about games, and they're empowering us to deliver these games, uh, you know, worldwide. And I think that is anything a developer, an ambitious developer could ask for in a publisher. And we are absolutely glad to have you guys. Thank you so much for your time. And I cannot wait to give people more information about Echoes of the End. From one side of the globe all the way to the other, if you like the game Gothic and hardcore RPGs, wait, what? Okay. The Last Oracle is just for you. I got to sit down with Please two have of a the trailer. guys from Gold Knights and talk all about them and their new game. Please have a Hello trailer. Hello there, guys. Today I am joined Please. by Gold Knights creative and game director Pavel Strunad and executive producer Vladimir Gershel to talk about their game, The Last Oracrew. Hi, Obao. Hi, Obao. So you guys make The Last Oracrew. What is the game about? It's an action RPG where I try to show the relativity of good and evil from different perspectives of living and breathing world. So when you guys say living and breathing, what do you mean exactly? <laughs> Uh, it is important to understand that The Last Oricru is quite challenging and skill-based RPG, but compared to many other titles in this genre, uh, our story does not take place in some dark and deadly realm. Waking up in a living and breathing sci-fi medieval world of Wardenia, players find themselves in the middle of war for supermancy over the whole planet. There is something interesting about the war, as usually warriors of each side believe that they do the right thing, often fighting for survival and well-being of their people. So the idea of the game is to show, show the player the war and the Trailer. euphoria on, of go. the winners, but also the misery of the losers, to make the player realize that the number of decisions he can make in the game will affect all the living beings in the world. Was there a kingdom So you mentioned that you made choices during the last Oracle. Yep. How impactful are they? The impact is major. First they're, of all, we are the one who decides which side will win the war. But there are many thing. different roads through, through the game, and you and can experience the whole game to only switch. after multiple playthroughs. I want it's to give to the, every player his own experience and, and try not to push any moral code of what is wrong and what is right. Simply, you make the decision and actions, and based on that, 
individual characters and their own reactions. This creates different situations, so you can find your own friends and allies and apply the way how you think it's right or fun. Exactly. Each player can define their own <laughs> path <laughs> the to side with different screen. fictions <laughs> or betray them and influence <laughs> the future of each race and in the end uh, the entire planet, basically. Uh, and it is not done uh, just by a few choices somewhere in, in dialogues or by completing some quests, no, but, your no. but by your continuous uh, actions and decisions. Let me give you an example. Um, in uh, many scenarios, there uh, you are asked to kill the, the general of Redkin people. Um, and you can obviously refuse doing that, but if you if you decide to kill him, there are many possibilities of uh, what you can do with his head, which serves as a proof of his death. Uh, you can okay. keep it and become hero, or you can give it to the queen and come closer to her heart, um, ah. or you can give it to another characters uh, of this conflict with uh, with different outcomes. While I'm playing, guys. If I decide to be a little bit mischievous and kind of go down the route of everyone hating me, what does that mean for me? Yes, there is an option that you will try to do as much harm to do as many beings as possible, and there are some dark characters that will be pleased by that. However, cooperation with them may be eventually very painful for you. That's another interesting thing, that often there is some hidden party involved in many wars, which profits from both sides of the conflict and the conflict itself. So that's a bit of the hidden part in the game, which you can play, but it will be a little bit difficult to play. Okay. So the game has co-op. Can a friend help me with the boss battles? Can we play the whole entire game together? How does this work? You know those lonely nights when you play games which are super exciting for you, but you feel a little bit sad that you cannot share that experience True. with anyone? That was generally True. the idea. Yeah, there is a great demand for couch play in the whole third-person action RPG genre. So we are sure that for our future audience, the, the co-op is going to be one of the most uh, or the, the key features of our game. And that's why we went even farther. Uh, we have many situations uh, what can be solved in co-op differently than in single player. So you can find new fun ways of how to, of how to kill some bosses yep. or solve some puzzles or read some special secret areas. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, combat is bread and butter of an uh, RPG. So if you, for example, play as a melee tank, uh, while the second player plays a magic support, you will enjoy tens of awesome I hope you show a trailer for this. Oh, wait. So you're telling me there's magic and melee? What does this mean for the combat of the game? Well, the combat is touched at more experienced players. I'm very much on the wave of recent challenging RPGs that are based on the skills of the player, timing and stamina. We are trying to build some interesting magic mechanism in the game that would let you use some more than block and fast attack buttons. Uh, but, you know, don't forget that our world has sci-fi roots. So what is for someone magic uh, can be for more developed culture or technology. But be prepared to die. A lot. Like a lot. Yeah, a lot. Well that's good. I and hope it's difficult. finally, guys, I just want to ask you, what does it mean to be under Koch Media's brand new label? Honestly, it was the best step we could do in our game development. It helped us dramatically increase the capacity of our development team and focus primarily on the game itself. And yet, we still have the full creative control over the game and all the feedback we are getting is really helping us to make a better game. So, so far, it was the best decision ever. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased that I could use my long-standing experience with big publishing houses and restructure the game and the team to shape <laughs> which was the right fit for such a strong partner as a, as a Koch Media. Uh, from the very beginning of our cooperation with Pavel, we were thinking big and aiming at building a really memorable new game franchise. And being part of the starting portfolio of a brand uh, new Yo, Koch Media label hey, three? gives us a great opportunity to fully achieve it. Sweden, let's go, dude. Thank you so much, Pavel and Vladimir, for your time. It's been awesome talking to Yo, you about Prime everything the Lost you. Aura crew. And I just can't wait for people to get their hands on it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. We teased it in the sizzle. And now let's hear from our friends at Starbreeze to talk yeah, about Payday 2, Payday 3, and their upcoming cooperation with Prime Matter. Thank you, Jeff, and hi, everyone. We're excited to be here, excited to talk about Payday, and excited to be working with Prime Matter. At Starbreeze, we see Payday as the ultimate bank robbing experience, inspired by classic heist movies, providing adrenaline-fueled gameplay where you get to experience the thrill of being on the wrong side of the law with a smart plan and a gun in your hand. This 
is what we've been doing. Since the original game, Payday the Heist, through the sequel, Payday 2, to the upcoming, Payday 3. And our ever-growing player community, our heisters, continue to be an inspiration for us in everything we do, pushing us to make the best Payday possible. The world of Payday is an exaggerated reflection of reality where order is kept by the long arm of the law. At least until the heisters turn this order into chaos, giving the law the middle finger. That's when adrenaline truly kicks in and the outnumbered gang keeps beating the odds, often escaping not gonna make the it much in a no, hail no. of bullets. The Payday universe has an ongoing narrative that has been created over the years. Yeah. The gang has built a reputation by going after the highest profile targets, setting up some of the craziest heist plans and going up against some of the most powerful of enemies. And through all of this, the gang keeps coming out on top. In their exploits, the gang has become, as they call it, the tightest crew ever. The wider criminal underworld of Payday lives its own life, where movers and shakers want a piece of the action or a piece of the Payday gang. In the gang's life of crime, they are way past the point of no return. And as we look ahead for what's to come, the gang will learn that there's no rest for the wicked. Hey. This legacy is something that we treasure and will build on, expanding on this epic story, taking you all with us into the future of Payday. Many millions of players have enjoyed Payday so far. It's been an amazing journey for us at Starbreeze. On Steam, Payday 2 has the biggest Steam. player community of any game. This truly means the world to us. Payday turns 10 this year, but uh, we're only getting started. With our team hard at work, cooperation with Prime Matter and other partners, and above all, a fantastic player community, we are looking to the future with great anticipation. I'm rich. It's payday, fellas. The release of Payday 3 is years away, but we oh. could finish off today with a sneak peek of what we're working hey. on. A uh, taste of things to come. All right. There it is, chat. Let's go. Well, there you have it. Oh. Quite a lineup. And <laughs> yeah, hopeful, I know we're going to be hearing much more from Prime Matter in the weeks and months ahead, right? Okay. That's a great question, Jeff. Prime Matter will be taking a huge leap into the streaming world. From June the 14th, we'll be streaming three times a week, every week, providing you guys with gameplay content, achievement and trophy hunting streams, as well as Dungeons and Dragons in our own universes, cooking streams, and so much more. We also want to get our developers involved and have it so that you guys get to know our developers better. Not only that, but expect to see a lot more shows from us in the future. And Jeff can help us out too. Absolutely. I cannot wait to see uh, what Prime Matter has for us in the future. Thanks for announcing with us yesterday at Summer Game Fest. And I look forward to being back with you again later this summer. No worries, Jeff. And thank you for your time. It's been awesome hosting with you. And I can't wait to do more in the future. And a thanks to you guys watching, to the streamers who are co-streaming, to our new gamers who are looking forward to the titles that we've shown you today. We are focusing on making fun, unique, and honest content for you guys. So stay safe, stay cool, and I will see you guys on Monday. Bye. Prime Matter, thanks for the, the 20 gifted. Thank you. Dookie Dookie Literature Club update? Oh god. Maybe at some point. Maybe at some point. What the fuck? Oh. Um. <clears throat> <clears throat> Cool spooky game. Oh. Hold up. I gotta... I can't move my dashboard, by the way. My whole dashboard is... Oh, here we go. 
Did they they must have updated something. Uh Cool. Um <clears throat> This? What you meant? The Mountain King. Let's check it. Okay, that looks very interesting. Here it is. Yo, I gotta play my alert. Sorry, I had hey, a pause you. here. Uh, wish is this. That looked very interesting, I gotta say. Hey, you. Yeah, okay. So, regarding the Koch Media hey, you. Uh, presentation, I, Dolmen was seemed the most interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, I think that was... Uh, Hey, you. Oh, yeah. You can see. Another victim. Yeah, they were very soul rifles. Okay, cool. Dinero. Are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? <laughs> okay. So the thing about dolmen, it means pretty much penis in Swedish. Dinero. And 30 minutes later. Speaking of socks, do you think red socks are better than blue socks? And, uh, dude, there were so many times in that interview, and that interview was long, and there were so many times in the interview where they would say sh they would say stuff like, can't wait for the release of Dolmen, and stuff like that, and it was just, oh, Jesus Christ. It was so hard to sit through because of that. It's spelled this way, yeah, it is. This literally means penis in Swedish, pretty much. <laughs> it's like a weird way of saying it. And it was so many times they would say stuff like that, and it was just, uh I haven't slept anything, so I thought it was hilarious. It's slang, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, um, hard to say. It, it was it was a lot of talk, so it was hard to follow it sometimes for sure. And like you you don't want you don't want to you don't want to talk over it because like then you interrupt the interview. And but it was like constant interview, so I couldn't really say anything. Hey, it was you. hard. hard.